So I want to tell you today about a classical problem about Brouwer groups. So let me just begin by reminding you what a Brouwer group is. Okay. So we'll just start in the general setting. So let's begin with the field. And let's say that we have a finite dimensional associative Unital algebra, okay, so potentially non commutative. Okay. Then the basic object of study are central simple algebra. So we say that A is central simple. Uh, if it has no non trivial two sided ideas. Non trivial meaning. It has no two sided ideals um, aside from itself and zero. Okay, so that's what it means to be central. Simple. And this is equivalent, I mean, you know, probably the most concrete way to think about it is that if I take my algebra and I go up to an algebra enclosure, what I get is a matrix algebra. This is the simplest way to say it. And um, <clears throat> this integer n that I get is called a degree. I mean, this is n, but it's, it's also just the square root of the vector space dimension. It's just the degree of the central scheme algebra. This is one of the most basic, it's like the most basic invariant. Um, and there's a nice way to sort of classify these central simple algebras up to an equivalence relation. So we say that A and B are equivalent if, and let me not write out all the quantifiers, but we just want an isomorphism between some matrix algebra with entries in the algebra A and some other matrix algebra, possibly a different size, with entries in B. So there exists an integer R and integer S and an isomorphism. Okay. And uh, the Brouwer group. <coughs> is simply the set of central simple algebras um, modulo the equivalence relation equipped with the tensor product of algebras. This is the Brouwer group. So let me, I should convince you that this is not like a trivial notion. <laughs> Okay. So the very first example of a Brouwer group that one meets is uh, the Brouwer group of the real numbers, and this turns out to be isomorphic to Z mod two. Okay, and the non-zero, the non-zero element is represented by Hamilton's quaternions. All right. So this is not really the kind of, I mean, at this point you could go off and talk about Brouwer groups of like local and global fields, which is a very large topic the theory of Brouwer groups, but I'm going to aim for something slightly different. I'm going to be talking about Brouwer groups of function fields of varieties. Okay, so let me start telling you what those look like. And let's suppose that I take some algebraically closed base field. All right. So first of all, if you stare at this, right, the Brouwer group of my algebraically closed field is necessarily trivial. And if I take the function field of a curve, so here C is going to be a curve over an algebraically closed field, this is also trivial. Right? This is by um, basically by sense theorem. This is a classical So, so in your in your definition, the complex numbers over R are, are central. Simple. No, they're not central. I forgot to say central. Oh, okay. Sorry, the center should also be K. I didn't write it. <clears throat> okay, and then finally, um, so so you might wonder if the pattern continues. <laughs> but if you take if you take the Brouwer group, so let me say. Let's say you look at the Brouwer group of a variety 
of dimension at least two. Okay, I'm just trying to convince you that these Broward groups are huge. So let me just assume for simplicity um, uh, that K is an uncountable field. Then uh, this thing is uncountable. Any variety of dimensions. So for curves, they're uninteresting, but starting with surfaces, these things become absolutely anomalous. Right. Okay. So to get a handle on them, um, what we do is we consider these two sort of basic invariants of how complicated a Brouwer class is. Let me tell you what those are. So if I take a class in the Brouwer group of any field, you can consider you can consider the period, okay, which is simply the order of alpha in the Brouwer group. And I didn't say it before, but the Brouwer group is a torsion group. This is always finite. And on the other hand, you can consider, so this is just a sort of naive group theoretic invariant. On the other hand, you can consider what I think is the more interesting invariant, which is the index. And the index just tells you how large a central simple algebra is that you need to represent alpha. So you take, one way to say it is you take the GCDs of uh, the degree of any central simple algebra of class alpha. Okay, but in fact, the theory of central simple algebras tells you that this is actually a minimum. That there's a unique the isomorphism, minimal representative. These are the two, two invariants. And it's a basic fact that, first of all, the period always divides the index. Okay. And second of all, that I'll just say it is briefly that the period and the index have the same time factor. And there is a sort of an ancient problem in the theory of Brouwer groups called the period index problem. which basically asks how much larger the index is allowed to be. Okay, and since they have the same prime factors, um, there's a very natural way to ask it, which is to find a constant, I guess I'll call it epsilon, even though it's not small, find a constant, ideally depending just on the field, okay, um, such that for any Brouwer class in the field, uh, the index divides the period raised to that power. Okay. This is the period index problem. Um, and it goes back to work in the 1930s on power groups of local, global fields. Okay. So I said I would be talking about Brouwer groups of function fields. So let me tell you what the basic conjecture is in that setting. Okay. So this is a conjecture. Um, usually, yeah, this is basically the period index conjecture. And uh, it was first, it was actually folklore for quite a long time, I think. Um, but it was first written down by Colio Tolet. Um, it was written down in unpublished notes for a talk in German. Um, they were on his website for many years, but he actually uploaded them to the archive on like Monday or Tuesday of this week. And you're like, what is this thing? It was where this conjecture first. Okay. So um, <laughs> yeah, it's easier to find now. Okay, so the conjecture is the following. So again, I'll take an algebraically closed base field and uh, I'll just take uh, some variety. And the conjecture is that for any element of the Brouwer group, and we saw earlier this Brouwer group can be quite large. For any element of the Brouwer group, uh, one has that the index divides the period 
the dimension minus one. Do you want k of x instead of just x in this formulation? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Dimension of x minus one. Okay. In other words, you can take epsilon to the dimension of x minus one. Okay, so this is the connection. So maybe I'll, I am not going to write it, so I guess I can say it while I'm writing the work. Um, the, uh, the reason for this conjecture, the motivation for the conjecture, is that oh, yeah. the motivation is just that if you take, if you start adjoining variables, like what should you do if you're trying to guess the conjecture? Right? If you start adjoining variables to k, and you write down, you know, you write down a Brouwer, you write down like the largest possible division algebra that you can. Um, uh, what should I say? <laughs> the uh, you write down a Brouwer class represented by the most like decomposable division algebra. You get this number. So in other words, like you write down an algebra, which is uh, uh, I guess I can't talk while erasing. I just <laughs> sentence fragments. <laughs> the conjecture is strong. Let's just put it like that. And it's just because you can write down algebras that are sort of obviously uh, sharp with respect to this convection. OK, so let me tell you what's known. Uh, it's very easy to say what's known. Okay. So <laughs> here's, here's one that we could all do together. If the dimension of x is less than or equal to 1, right? This one's pretty good. Then uh, you, know, you have to check what the period in the index are, they're both one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's good because the Brouwer group is um, the Brouwer group of the function field will be zero by the time's theorem. We talked about this in the video. Okay, so the really interesting thing happens when you have a surface, okay, and in this case, it is known. Okay, this is a theorem um, of De Jong from 2004. Okay, it's actually quite a hard theorem. Um, and I should say, I mean, actually, he didn't. So, what, what the Young proved is that it holds when the period is prime to the characteristic. And in the general case, um, there's you have to use uh, later results of de Young and Starr and also of uh, Lieblich to reduce that sort of. From the positive characteristic case to characteristic zero. This is quite a hard result. And then, um, if the dimension is at least three, it's not known for any x. Okay. There is no field of transcendence degree at least three, where we have a bound like this, really any bound at all on the whole Brouwer group. Um, so there's a huge barrier. Okay. So this is the, uh, the picture. Now, so let me, uh, let me talk, so let me say a few words. I'm going to tell you some, some results, but before I do, let me just tell you a sort of the global picture of the conjecture. Okay. So the setting I'm going to take for the rest of the talk is I'm going to take x to be smooth and projective over the complex numbers. And um, so inside of the Brouwer group of the function field, which is generally ginormous, there is a particular subgroup, which is the Brouwer group of x. Okay, and the way this is cooked up, let me not say it in sort of much detail, but this was defined through central simple algebras, and this thing is defined through Azimaya algebras. Which, in an Azimaya algebra, is just something where if I had, it's a sheaf of algebras, of OX algebras, R and X, and if you have a map 
from some field to x, and you take your algebra and you pull it back. You get a central symbol. That's basically characterizing. So it's some device. It's just a global version of, of a central symbol. Okay, um, so this is the this is the thing, and so the point here is that well, first of all, I won't write it, but but actually, there's a general principle in the period index problem where if you're trying to get period index bounds for all fields, you can just get them for all of these subgroups. Okay, it's a little bit of a subtle principle, so I'm not going to try to write out all the quantifiers, but but it is it is uh, an interesting problem for these subgroups. And the point is that the period index problem here is a global problem. Let me explain why. So associated, so if I take some alpha in this sort of global Brouwer group, all right, I can associate to it a category, which is a twisted derived category. Um, and so this was first studied in detail by Alvarado, perhaps. And one way to think about this is you can think about it as uh, the derived category. There's many ways to think about it, but you can think about it as the derived category of, um, you know, bounded complexes of uh, OX coherent left A modules, where you've chosen an Azumai algebra representing A. Okay. So you just think of it as you have a sheaf of algebras, you look at the corresponding category of algebras. Um, and the other thing that we're going to consider is its A group, which is I mean, the growth of D group in this category. And the point, the reason that, um, that derived is, is this, is that you can um, is that you can figure out how to read for is that you can give a global definition of the uh, index. So the key fact here, right? So there is a, um, of course, there's a rank map from the growth indie group to Z. All right. If you had no Brouwer class, this map is completely like totally uninteresting, right? You always have live models; it's surjective, but it's never surjective when alpha is not trivial. And so the key fact. Is that if you look at the image of this rank map, so like the, the rank of the A module A is one, for instance, is that I just want to figure how it works? No, no, no. So actually, you can. What you should. Sorry, maybe I should say it because it's. If you think of it as A modules, it's a little tricky. But take the rank as an OX module. Okay. Okay. So and then, but then actually, if you're thinking about it this this way, you should divide by the square root of the rank of the Azumar algebra. Okay, because it turns out they're just all divisible by this. Um, they are, sure, sure, so sure. This, this would be a reasonable notion of rank. Mm -hmm. Okay, and with this notion, the image of this rank map tells you the index of the Brouwer class at the, you know, this is the index at the generic, the index on the function field. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this um right so I could have said this without derived category. I mean I could have just done the abelian category of coherent sheets, right? But actually the point is, and that maybe that seems better because you know if you think about derived categories, right, they don't really behave very well with respect to rank maps. Like uh, they're not preserved by auto equivalences or equivalences between categories. But somehow that's actually the whole point, right? That's actually super useful in this business that this category has symmetries that don't preserve the hard thing you're trying to calculate. 
so we'll, if I get to the end of the talk, we'll see how this can be quite useful. Um, okay, so let me, I want to state some results, so let me just make a remark. So, so let me talk a little bit about abelian varieties. Okay, so this is a case where, I think this is an interesting example, and it's a case where uh, if you have, so let's say x, and I have some Brouwer group, some Brouwer class on X, okay, a global Brouwer class. And this Brouwer group is quite large. It's actually uh, Q mod Z to the rank of the transcendental lattice or to the second Betty number minus the minus the Picard number. Okay. And there's actually a trivial bound in this case, I mean trivial. Um, there's a trivial bound on the index. It turns out that the index in this setting always divides the period to the dimension. Okay. This isn't, let me, for the sake of time, let me not go through it, but it's just a computation with colon. It's very straightforward. Um, and uh, so what's not obvious, however, is that you can lower this to dimension minus one, which is the conjecture. Right? That's the goal. So what I want to say in the last few minutes of the talk is um, I want to tell you about a theorem, which is joint with Alex Perry, which says the following. If x is an abelian uh, threefold, and alpha is any Brouwer class, then in fact one has the conjecture. Right? The index of alpha divides the period of alpha. In this case, the conjecture says squared. Right. So this is what I want to talk about. Over the numbers. Yes, over, yeah, over. Yeah, for the rest of the talk, actually. Um, yeah, you can, I mean, if you're algebraically closed, the period is prime to the characteristic, you reduce to this. This is what I want to say. Okay, so there are two steps in the proof. So uh, So, oh, I need to draw. <laughs> it's my first time here. First of all, we have the thing that we're trying to compute, which is the image of this rank map, right? And it turns out that this thing, it factors through a very interesting Hodge structure, okay? So let me say a little bit about uh, what the Hodge structure is. Um, it factors through a Hodge structure which is supported on twisted topological case. Think of as so this is a gadget, and um, you know there's a general formalism of uh, Alex Perry, which says that for any sort of reasonable category, like the twisted drive category, you have this group, and this thing carries a natural weight zero Hodge structure. So if there's no Brouwer class, um, if there's no Brouwer class, it's simply the topological k theory of x. And moreover, this map factors through the subgroup of integral Hodge classes for this Hodge structure. Okay? So the strategy is to basically 
prove the integral of Hodge conjecture for this category in the following sense. So the strategy is, first of all, you're going to construct um, a class V in here. And I'll say a little bit about how this is done, so I don't run out of time. A rank whose rank is the thing that is desired, which is period squared. Okay. So this will require you to compute this construction. Okay. And the second step, which is the tricky step, is to show that this class is algebraic. Right? It's a Hodge class, and you're trying to show that it comes from a class in algebraic. So since I have only a few minutes left, let me be a little bit brief. Maybe I'll focus on step two, if that's somehow the more interesting one. But step one, I'll say one word about it, which is that it relies on the theory of twisted and high structures, which was uh, you know, worked out uh, Primarily in the case of K3 surfaces, but would recently worked out by Weibrex and the like. So it turns out that this, this hot structure here is a kind of twisted structure. But that's all I'll say. Okay, so once you construct this, uh, this class, right, the goal is to show that it comes from algebraic K theory. And what you do is you can consider, what you're going to do is you're going to consider a moduli space of stable objects of class B. Okay? And it's a funny thing. You write down this moduli space, and all you have to do is show it's not empty. Right? If it's not empty, you're going to have one object of the right rank. And that's all you need. Okay? So you have a funny problem, which is you have a moduli space of extremely high rank objects on an abelian threefold, and you just have to show it's not empty. That's it. Okay? And, uh, the device that's used for this, so is that this thing, so this thing it has basically we're on a Calabi of threefold and it has expected dimension zero. Okay. And there is a device for counting the number of points that it wishes it would be. Okay. It may not be, it's almost never the expected dimension, but there's a virtual cycle that tells you the um, how many points it would be if it were actually dimension zero, right? And this is, comes out of Donaldson Thomas. This is a Donaldson Thomas event. Okay, so let me just, uh, I think I started at two pass. Is that right? Yeah. Just squeeze those last seconds. Oh, good, I hardly remember. Um, so let me just say one word about how this is done. So, so how do you compute these things? The way it's done is the following, right? So we have this stability condition, and we have this moduli space, right? And sort of what happens so uh, the method is that, first of all, so let me just tell you the sort of flexibility that these invariants admit. Well, first of all, they're deformation invariant. Okay. These counts for any of these moduli spaces. They're deformation invariant. Okay, this is already extremely useful. So for instance, I could deform and just kill the Brouwer class. Then this problem has nothing whatsoever to do with the Brouwer group. So the second thing is that if your class B is, and let me just be brief for the sake of time, if it's sufficiently positive in a, in a precise sense, I mean, just in the sense that on a K3 you could have a Mukai vector with B squared plus 2 being a positive the analog in this picture, then this class is invariant. Under, well, first of all, it's invariant 
under wall crossing of stability conditions. Okay. And this implies actually that it's invariant under the action of autoequivalences. Okay. And so here the point is that, like I said earlier, autoequivalences don't preserve the rank. Right? So in the end, you cook up, you deform, and you cook up autoequivalences that will carry your class V to something that looks like the ideal sheaf of a curve. And you're doing curve counts in the end. Okay? So the final reduction is to you reduce to uh, these virtual Donaldson Thomas theory curve counts on abelian threefolds, which were worked out. You know, by many people, particularly uh, Oberdeek and Chen, and many others in the long series of papers. Okay. So, in the end, you reduced the characters. Okay, sorry for running over. Stuff.